This morning as we get started though with our message, I would ask for you to turn to Genesis chapter 7. Take your Bibles and turn with me to Genesis chapter 7 this morning. And while you're turning there, I'm going to share with you some humorous lessons that we can learn from Noah. Okay? And the first of those is don't miss the boat. Okay? I think that one's kind of self-explanatory. Uh, but don't miss the boat. Number two, remember if you make it onto the boat, we're all in the same boat. Okay? The third one is to plan ahead. Because it was not raining when Noah started to build the ark. So be sure to plan ahead. Another one is, uh, as we get older, it's important that we stay fit. Because when you're 600 years old, someone may ask you to do something big. Another one is that you shouldn't listen to critics. Just do the job that needs to be done. Another one is to build your future on high ground. And for number seven, it would be to, when it comes to traveling, for safety's sake, travel in pairs. Okay? Number eight is to remember that speed is not always an advantage. Remember, the snails were on the ark with the cheetahs. Okay? Uh, and so, uh, number nine is that when you're stressed, float a while. And then number ten is probably one of the more important ones we can take away from the story of Noah. And that is to remember that the ark was built by amateurs and the Titanic was built by professionals. Think about that one for just a moment. But nevertheless, uh, you know, some of these lessons are uh, humorous and uh, things that uh, we can find some humor in the story of Noah and the flood. But today we're going to continue in our, in our series on the days of Noah. And we're going to take a look at three important lessons that we can take uh, from the story uh, when we start to look at Noah and the ark and the flood. And so this morning I want to ask you to stand with me one last time as we give honor to the reading of God's word as we do every time uh, we read it in service. And we're in verse 11 of Genesis chapter 7 today. It says, beginning in verse 11, it says, In the 600th year of Noah's life, on the 17th day of the second month, on that day all the springs of the great deep burst forth, and the floodgates of the heavens were opened. And rain fell on the earth for 40 days and 40 nights. On that very day, Noah and his sons, Shem, Ham, and Japheth, together with his wife and the wives of his three sons, entered the ark. They had with them every wild animal according to its kind, all livestock according to their kinds, every creature that moves along the ground according to its kind, and every bird according to its kind, everything with wings. Pairs of all creatures that have the breath of life in them came to Noah and entered the ark. The animals going in were male and female of every living thing, as God had commanded Noah. Then the Lord shut him in. For forty days the flood kept coming on the earth, and as the waters increased, they lifted the ark high above the earth. The waters rose and increased greatly on the earth, and the ark floated on the surface of the water. They rose greatly on the earth, and all the high mountains under the entire heavens were covered. The waters rose and covered the mountains to a, de to a depth of more than fifteen cubits. Every living thing that moved on land perished. Birds, livestock, wild animals, and all the creatures that swarm over the earth and all mankind. Everything on, earth, uh, everything on dry land that had the breath of life in its nostrils died. Every living thing on the face of the earth was wiped out. People and animals and the creatures that move along the ground and the birds were wiped from the earth. Only Noah was left and those with him in the ark. The waters flooded the earth for 150 days. So let's pray. God, we thank you for uh, your word and what it tells us about the flood. We thank you for what it means to us to be able to read this set of scripture and to understand exactly how uh, you brought about your plans for mankind through this time with Noah. God, we pray that as we have read your word we pray that it would sink deep into our hearts that it would resonate in our minds and god that we would understand what message you're trying to share with us through the through the word in genesis today 
God, I pray that through uh, this time that we are able to worship together in the Word. Father, I pray that your words would be the words that are heard by us today, that your Holy Spirit would speak to our hearts, that you would uh, speak to our minds today and help us to understand and grasp the truths that you share with us today through Genesis chapter 7. And in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. You can be seated. Last week, we started off our series on the days of Noah, and we started off by looking at the build-up to the flood, sort of what brought about the need for this flood. And we talked about how sin consumes the world. We talked about how judgment is planned and how righteousness brings hope, as we looked at the story of Noah last week. And today, we pick up where we left off last time in the story. Noah had been warned of God's plan for judgment when his plan to destroy all of the life on earth. Noah was told how because of his relationship with God that his family and him and the uh, animals would be uh, safe on the ark. And he was uh, told how all of this would come about. And so today we pick up in the next part of the story, in the next part of what goes on in the story of Noah, after he had worked for 100 years to build this ark, to preach righteousness to the people, and encourage them to repent and change of their ways. Uh, and we find ourselves at the beginning of the flood. We find ourselves when raindrops fall on the earth for the first time ever and Noah is prepared to start walking into the ark uh, with those animals. As I shared at the beginning of the message, there are lessons that we can learn from Noah. Some of them are humorous, uh, obviously, but some of them are life-changing messages and lessons that we can learn from Noah and the ark and the flood. And so of all the lessons that we could learn from this story, none are probably as important as the three that we're going to look at today. And so the first of those lessons comes to us from verses 11 and 12. And this lesson is that God brings judgment. See, we know from Genesis chapter 6 uh, that in the days of Noah, the wickedness of the, uh, uh, and the sin of mankind had completely engulfed the, all of mankind. It, it had completely consumed all of mankind. And as the text tells us last, or told us last week, it consumed man all of the time. It was all the time that man was consumed by sin. And because of man's sinfulness, God planned a judgment against mankind's sins. And his judgment was to destroy everything on earth that had the breath of life in it. And that was everything except for Noah, his family, and two of each animal. And so verses 11 and 12 tell us about what happened uh, in this time when Almighty God's judgment and His wrath against sin was, really, uh, was basically released against uh, that creation that He had made. And we're told that the springs in the earth that had been there since God created uh, the heavens and the earth, there were these wellsprings in the earth that broke forth, they broke open, and the waters poured out of them onto the surface of the ground of the earth. And in addition to that, we see how uh, those wellsprings coupled with the floodgates of heaven just pouring down rain for 40 days and 40 nights brings about this cataclysmic flood that would just destroy all life on earth. There was basically nowhere to uh, escape. And the rain poured down, as we know from the story. 40 days and 40 nights it rained and uh, the flood uh, occurred. And this was bringing God's judgment on sin and mankind uh, in a way that they had never experienced before and no one has experienced since. Now keep in mind though that when we talk about this judgment, we talk about Noah and the flood and uh, a lot of times. And when we look at that, we have to understand that Noah is not the one who brought the judgment. It was not in Noah's control. It was not in Noah's power to be able to bring that. It was not because of 
Noah's righteousness versus the sinfulness of everybody else that all of a sudden God just said, well, I'm going to bring this flood because Noah's so good and everybody else is so bad. You know, the judgment that was being leveled against mankind was a divine mandate from the God of the universe against the rampant sinfulness of mankind. That's what it was. God had a judgment that he was bringing against mankind. And we're told in the scriptures that this is not the only time God will bring judgment, but we're told that his judgment later will be different. There's a story that is told of uh, pioneers that were crossing the uh, central states uh, as they were headed west to go take up homesteading uh, 150 years ago or more. And as they were heading across the central states, uh, they uh, had their wagons, their uh, their oxen, their livestock, and their families, uh, their covered wagons, everything going west. And as, the, as this particular group uh, that the story is shared about uh, makes it to this one particular part, they look out in the horizon to the west, and there is just this long line of columns of smoke, this long line of smoke going up uh, into the heavens. And as they uh, watch, at first they don't know what to make of it, and then they realize what they're looking at is basically that the prairie in the distance is on fire. Uh, that a wildfire somehow had been started and uh, was consuming the prairie and was coming towards them. And so they knew that they had passed a, uh, they crossed the river uh, a few days before, but they didn't have time to go back and uh, use that as shelter or you know, get water from that to protect themselves. Uh, so they were sort of at a loss and then as to what they needed to do. And at that point, there was a gentleman in the group who knew what needed to happen. So what he encouraged them to do was to burn up an area right where uh, they were at, to burn up a large area that uh, was large enough for their entire group to fit inside of. And so they, they burnt the, the grass and the, uh, the prairie right there where they were at. And uh, after they were done, they moved all of their livestock, they moved their, uh, their wagon, their covered wagons, their families, everybody into the middle of that. And it was a big area that they were able to, uh, to uh, be inside of. And as the flames continued uh, towards them, uh, it was uh, said that one young lady asked uh, if they were going to be burned up, if they were going to uh, die in the fire. And the uh, gentleman who had uh, encouraged them to burn this one particular area said this to her. He said, the flames cannot reach us here for we are standing where the fire has been. And so uh, in that case, what we see in that, uh, in that story is a picture of a believer in Christ who is safe in Christ. And the fires of God's judgment, as we know it, burned themselves out on Christ. And just like uh, those that were uh, in that circle, in that area, uh, they were safe. And, and like the believer, they are in Christ, so they are safe forever. And uh, they're standing basically where the fire has been when we, when we think about it in that regards. And, we, and I tell you that story and use that example because of, of this very reason. I mentioned that Noah survived the judgment of his day, but we know that there will be a judgment in another day. And one day, each and every one of us will stand before God and be judged. Every one of us, every last person will stand before God and experience his judgment. And the judgment is not brought about on us for any other reason than the holiness of God and Him judging the sinfulness of mankind, the sins that mankind uh, do. And see, in that day when we stand before God, just like every one of us will do, we will be in one of two categories, if you want to look at it from that perspective. We will either be standing before God, and we'll be standing before the God of the universe in our sinfulness, deserving and receiving the unfiltered wrath and judgment of God against our sin, or we will be like those pioneers that I told you about, standing where the fire had already burned. We'll be standing in the righteousness of Christ because we have a relationship with Christ. And when God brings that judgment or that time of judgment comes for us, God will look at us and rather than seeing our sinfulness, 
He will see the righteousness of Christ because we have taken on the righteousness of Christ because of our relationship with Christ. And so when Christ died on the cross, he took the wrath of God against our sinfulness on himself so that we would avoid the judgment, so that we would avoid the fire, so to speak, because he took that, uh, took that wrath when he became sin for us. See, if we stand before God in the day of His judgment, if we stand as one who has received God's forgiveness for our sins and we avoid the judgment, then it's because we understand the next lesson that we learn from Noah. And that is that God offers grace. See, we're told about the grace of God in these verses in a way that should drive home our understanding of what God's grace looks like. See, in verses 13 through 16, we are told that on the day that the flood started, the animals entered the ark, followed by Noah and his family. But we, we read that in verses 13 through 16. But the thing that I want to bring to your attention are the final six words of that particular uh, verse in verse 16. Because these six words describe for us God's grace in an unmistakable way for us to understand it. Because it's, those words say this. It says, Then the Lord shut him in. Talking about Noah and the animals and his family. They were all shut in the ark. But it was the Lord that did it. See, we can glance over these words really quick. If we're reading through the story, we, we read it, we just sort of become oblivious to it. You know, we just sort of, oh, okay, well, that's just something else that uh, is said in that particular text. But we can read through it without fully understanding what this shows us about the grace that God has for us. Because one thing we see about the grace of God is that He alone offers it. No one else offers that grace except for him. See, Noah did not offer grace to the people around him, to the ones that were his critics, to the ones that ridiculed him for building a boat in the middle of the desert and rain had never even occurred before. You know, he had plenty of critics. There were plenty that could have, uh, you know, had all sorts of issues with what he was doing. But it was not Noah's responsibility to extend grace to them. It was Noah's job to build the ark, to preach righteousness, and encourage people to repent and change their ways uh, from their sinfulness. And that's what his responsibility was, was to preach the righteousness and repentance to the people so that they could accept God's grace. See, we talk about grace in the church. We hear people talk about it. And it's one of those things that we come, become sort of desensitized to a lot of times. But what we need to understand is simply what grace is. Grace is getting something that we don't deserve. Uh, it's, it's receiving something that we don't never really deserved in the first place. And that's what grace is all about. It's like a gift. If someone gives you a gift... Uh, as gifts should be given with no strings attached, I give you a gift because I have a gift for you, then that gift is something that you don't deserve. You don't get it for any other reason other than the fact that you're being given a gift. Well, that's what grace is. Grace is getting something that we don't deserve. All we have to do is accept it. Just like the gift. All we have to do to receive a gift, you know, like with the shoeboxes that they give away with uh, Operation Christmas Child, it's a gift. We give, it's given to them. All the kid has to do is stick their hands out and receive it. All they have to do is take it. And that's the same thing that grace is. All we have to do is receive it. We, just, we accept it and we receive it, not we would any other gift. But see, God extended grace to the people that were around Noah. God extended grace to the ones who ridiculed Noah. The ones that were critical of Noah. The ones that made fun of Noah. He gave them grace. He warned them through Noah's preaching. He warned them through the fact that Noah is building this huge boat in the middle of the desert and there's no rain, there's no water coming down. And God gave them 100 years to repent, to change their ways. He gave them 100 years to pursue the righteousness that Noah was preaching about. He gave them 100 years to accept God's gift of grace. But they never did. But see, there's something else that we see about the grace of God. And it's that at some point, 
God will quit offering grace. That's a very powerful lesson we need to understand. Because I want you to notice that it was God who closed the door of the ark. Not Noah, not his sons. It was God that closed the ark. He's the one that closed it and sealed it up. Can you imagine what kind of guilt Noah would have carried had he and his sons been the ones responsible for closing the ark? You know, he closes the ark and, you know, he probably would have been thinking, you know, well, maybe somebody else is on their way. Maybe somebody has finally changed. You know, and he's thinking, maybe I closed it 10 minutes too early. Maybe I closed it an hour too early. Or maybe when people are beating on the side of the ark, when the water is ankle deep, knee deep, chest deep, screaming, wanting in the ark because they know Noah is in there. They know that he is safe. Had Noah been the one that closed the door, he might would have opened the door to save people. But it was God that closed the door. It was God who was the one who offered the grace to enter the ark and they never took advantage of it. Here is the thing. God is the one who offers grace and God is the one who takes away the offer for grace. Because God's patience... His grace had run its course and it was time for the judgment. It was time for judgment to begin. So God closed the door to the ark and He closed the door to His grace. If you've never accepted Jesus Christ, uh, the gift that He offers you in eternal life, if you've never started a relationship with Jesus Christ, I want you to listen very closely to what I have to say. Because one day, one day, a day known only to the God of the universe, not a day that we know of, not a day that we can pinpoint or anything like that, His offer of grace to you will end. That's not Pastor Nick guessing. That's the Word of God telling us the truth. There will be a day when the grace that God has offered you through to have a relationship with Jesus Christ, there will be a day when He closes that door of grace for you. He'll close that offering to you, meaning that you will no longer have the opportunity to accept salvation. That you'll never have the opportunity to accept that free gift of grace that God offers to you. The eternal life that is offered through Christ's death on the cross. There will be a time when God cuts you off, so to speak. And when that day comes, either because of your physical death or because Jesus comes back, whichever one happens first... When that happens, you will be out of opportunities to accept God's grace. So like the people in the days of Noah, you'll be left on the outside looking in at what could have been your saving grace. And so it's important that we take stock of what God has for us, the grace that He offers us. Because the grace that He offers through Christ leads us to that final lesson that we're uh, looking at today that we can learn from Noah, and that is that God provides salvation. See, we're told about the totality of God's judgment against mankind. We're told about how final God's judgment and how total and complete God's judgment was against mankind with the flood. Because the flood waters rose. Uh, the waters rose and rose quickly, and as it did, uh, it's been estimated that the, the gross tonnage of the ark itself would have weighed about 14,000 pounds. That's an estimate, but nevertheless, there was enough water to get this big boat off of the ground. And the water continued to rise until the highest mountains on earth were submerged by more than 20 feet. The Bible says 15 cubits, that's about 22 feet. But nevertheless, the tallest mountains on earth are covered by more than 20 feet of water. And you might be saying, okay, Pastor Nick, why would it say you know, that those mountains were covered by you know, just 20 feet of water? Well, the reason that the height is given as far as how high the water was, was to show that absolutely nothing could have survived the flood. No people, no animals, no insects, no birds, no nothing. Nothing could survive the flood because there was nowhere to go to seek salvation. There was nowhere to be saved. And so it puts it very clearly in verse 22 where it says, Everything on dry land that had the breath of life in its nostrils died. 
That is all inclusive. Everything, meaning that everything died. There was nothing left. See, the totality of the flood shows us that God alone provides salvation. There is no other salvation other than what God provides. Who provided Noah, as we talked about in the children's sermon? Who provided him with the plans for the ark? Who provided him with the plans to get the animals in there? God did. Who told Noah to go into the ark? Who closed the door behind Noah? God did. And so we see that only God offers salvation. In the story we're reading, God offered salvation. Only He extended that salvation only to Noah and his family. Verse 23 says, Only Noah was left and those with him in the ark. See, not a single person could save themselves from the flood. There was nothing that they could do to rescue themselves from their own judgment for sin and find themselves rescued. There was nothing that they could do. They couldn't be good enough. They couldn't try and do enough good things. They couldn't hold on to the side of the ark long enough. They couldn't beg loud enough for Noah to open the ark. They couldn't climb the tallest tree on the tallest mountain and hope to get out of the flood. There was no way that a person could save themselves because they don't provide salvation. Only God provides salvation. And salvation in the days of Noah was provided by God and God alone. In ancient Egypt, death and the afterlife was a big part of their culture. Uh, it, it was like this, uh, this not dark cloud, but just this cloud that followed them all the time. They, they thought about it. They talked about it. There were, a lot of their life was spent preparing for the afterlife or the underworld, as they would call it. And we know that the, the pyramids were just basically big tombs for the uh, pharaohs and for people to be buried in. But for the Egyptians, that path to eternal life uh, was full of all kinds of dangers. There were uh, false trails that people uh, could be led down as they uh, thought. And uh, they thought that they needed to be very well prepared for death. And so they actually had a book called the Book of the Dead. And in this book, it gave you uh, different instructions. It gave you tips. It gave you incantations to say and all these things that were to help you get, once you die, uh, to get from the, the world of the living, so to speak, uh, to, the, uh, to the world of the dead and to the underworld. And this book was oftentimes uh, in scrolls and things like that. It would be put into coffins. It would be put into sarcophagus. Uh, it would be put into tombs and things like that. And so that the people would be prepared for the afterlife. Uh, but one of the final things that they would do when they prepared to bury someone was they would actually remove the heart from the person, from the deceased person, and they would weigh it on a, on a scale of some sort. I don't know what the, I don't know what the threshold was here, but I, uh, the, what they would do is they would weigh the heart, and if it was light, uh, if it didn't weigh very much, then it would be their understanding that that person uh, had lived the right kind of life, I guess you would say, and that they would make it into uh, the land of the gods, so to speak. That was their, their belief. But on the flip side of that, if someone had a very heavy heart, then they viewed it as being full of evil and, uh, and that the person would be devoured by a monster and that their uh, spirit or their soul would be banished into the darkness. That was the, that was the view that the Egyptians had. But see, one great thing about the God that we serve is we don't have to worry about those sort of things. We don't have to worry about the same things that the Egyptians believed about how difficult it was to, to make it to a place of eternal life. We don't have to worry about all of those things because when this life is over, we don't have to worry about dangers and false trails. We don't have to worry about something keeping us from experiencing the eternal life that God has for us. We don't have to uh, take a book with us that will you know, be our GPS and show us how to get where we need to go and, and give us tips and directions and things like that. And we don't have to worry about having our heart weighed and find out was it one fraction of a gram too much or one fraction of a gram too little uh, to get us where we wanted to go. Uh, we don't have to worry about all that because for us to experience uh, the eternal life that God offers us, all we have to do is accept the salvation that He offers. 
That's all we have to do. We just have to accept that salvation and that is all we have to do because this salvation is based on nothing more than our belief in Jesus Christ being who He says He is and that's it. It's Jesus plus nothing. It's Jesus and our belief in Him and that's exactly what it is. See, if you put your faith in Christ and then if you put your faith in Christ because you believe in Him, then what you have the opportunity to do is you believe Him and you believe He is who He says He is and because of that you ask Him to be your Lord. You ask Him to be your master of your life, to direct you, to lead you where you need to go, to help you uh, in this life. But also you ask Him to be your Savior, meaning that you ask Him to forgive you of your sins, that you ask Him to, uh, to be the one who provides you with salvation. And all you have to do is confess your sins. All you have to do is repent of those sins, turning away from your sin, turning back to God, and then ask Him to be your Lord and Savior. Lord, I want you to be that master. I want you to be that one who saves me. And that's all it takes for us to accept that salvation that God provides. It was as simple as all of those people who stood around ridiculing Noah to take the step of faith and step onto the ark. That was all it took for them to receive salvation, but no one did it. See, for us, it's as simple as belief in Jesus being who He says He is. And because of that, we ask Him to be our Lord and our Savior. That's all it takes for us to accept the salvation that God provides for us. See, when you accept the grace that God offers and the salvation that He provides, then you will avoid that judgment that is coming. It's that simple. God extends this gift to us and says, I want a relationship with you. And if you accept that gift, you accept that grace, you accept that salvation based on what Jesus Christ did on the cross by dying for your sins, then you avoid the judgment. You stand in that place where the judgment has already been metered out against Christ and you don't have to worry about the judgment. There's a story that Billy Graham has uh, shared before about how he was driving through a town somewhere in the south. He wouldn't exactly say where it was at. But he tells a story of driving through the south and getting pulled over by a police officer. Uh, the police officer pulled him over for speeding and uh, when asked uh, about what was going on, you know, Billy Graham told him, said, yeah, I'm guilty of speeding. You know? And the officer told him, said, well, you still have to go to court. He said, that, you know, there's nothing I can do about it. You have to go to court. So Billy Graham went to court to settle up, you know, what was uh, required of him. And when he stood before the judge, the judge asked him, said, are you guilty or not guilty? And Billy Graham said, I'm guilty. And uh, the judge told him, said, well, since you're uh, guilty, what I'm going to do is your fine is going to be $1 for every mile over the speed limit you were going. Since you were 10 miles over, your penalty or your fine is $10. And so after the judge had handed out his fine to Billy Graham, he finally realized who was standing before him to, you know, to have to pay this fine. And he realized it was uh, the famous Billy Graham. And so... Uh, the judge suddenly stopped and here's what he said. He told Billy Graham, he said, you have violated the law. The fine must be paid, but I am going to pay it for you. And so the judge takes a $10 bill out of his wallet, fixes it to the, the ticket that Billy Graham had received, and he paid the bill or paid the fine for Billy Graham. And then Billy Graham goes on to tell the story that as soon as court was done, the judge took Billy Graham out for a state dinner. And so, uh, you know, Billy Graham tells this story, and here is what he says. He says, that is how God treats repentant sinners. God extends grace to us. He gives us something we don't deserve. He gives us that $10, so to speak. And then he gives us salvation. That big steak dinner with baked potato and salad and all that good stuff that we're all getting hungry for because it's almost lunchtime. But that's the way God treats us so that we can avoid that judgment. He offers us that grace, something that we don't deserve. And then when we accept that, He does so much more for us. He provides us with that salvation because He wants a relationship with us. And that's what He wants to do in our lives. See, this is an example, this story that Billy Graham shares is an example of what God did for Noah when He brought judgment on all of mankind, when He brought judgment on the earth. He offered Noah that grace and that salvation. And for us, He does the same thing through Jesus' death on the cross. He offers that grace to us. 
He offers us that thing that we did not deserve. And in addition to that, He provides us with salvation. And all we have to do is accept it. That's all we have to do. We have to accept it and receive that salvation that He offers to us. That's all He wants to do. And see, what we need to understand is the importance of this in our lives because, like I said earlier, one day that grace that God is extending to us, one day He's going to shut the door. And when He shuts that door, there's absolutely nothing we can do. There's no second chances. There's no other opportunities. 